but by now we have a much better understanding that physical things can do which makes it entirely possible for many of us that we are sad things. So I'm thinking for instance of computers and robots for regards to the idea that the physical things can do something as complicated as play a game of chess world theme on the course. But now of course we know that physical things and if you're looking at a computer you are looking at such a physical things can do actual that. They can understand language, they could recognize objects, they could store things in memory, they can make inferences and so on. Now for some of the things they don't do at anywhere near as well as people do. So when we talk about language development, for instance, we see that a two-year-old child uses and understands language better than any computer around. So we need to bear that it's is no longer not to say that physical things can do all of the rich and psychologically diverse and psychologically complicated things that people do, which means that we have to take seriously the claim that we are in fact such radical things. The final conditions is that the pyramids evidence that the brain is in fact the root of mental life. So put aside all that philosophical abstract arguments there is just tons of direct evidence. To some extent that direct evidence has always been there. You don't have to be born in the 20th or 21st century to appreciate that getting hit in the head could affect your consciousness and your memory. To appreciate that decades like syphilis can lead to disruption of the will and of consciousness. Alzheimer's can drop you of your rationality. That coffee and alcohol can inflame the just is so evident in everyday life that if physical events that affect the brain can affect ourselves, such thing that at the very least our mental life is immediately connected to the brain, our recent or something else has happened which is we have developed technologies that allow us to look directly into the brain, look at the brain's activation and uh, interform parents of the brain activation what people are thinking. So very goodly you can put somebody into a scanner, an fMRI scanner, and you could tell whether or not are thinking about language or music or sex. The technology is increasing. There is such a point that is not imp impossible that for some of you by the time you are listening to this, we can put a sleeping person under fMRI scanner and know from neural parents of neural feelings now that you are dreaming. All of this I think it is very difficult to keep this in mind and hold on to the view of dualism. I think materialism, however uncomfortable, however unplayable, is a view that the science forces us to adopt. Metamorphosis involves the transformation and along before that in Ulysses the characters are transformed, some of the characters are transformed by an evil witch into pigs. It's none of you to look to people and turn them into pigs, rather it's much worse. They part them in the body of pigs at the passage does. They had the head and voice and bristles and body of swine, but their mind minor unchanged than before. So they were pent there within our conception that bodies and cells are separate allows us to accept the idea you had many people inhabited in one body. This is now many people think about mostly personality disorder, something we'll get to quite later on the course. It's also at the root of the view that many people, both religions and non religions, hold, which is the idea of demonic possession. Your body can be taken over by somebody else. Another manifestation of dualism is you could believe in intelligent beings without bodies. If mind and body are separate, it raises the possibility you could could have one without the other. Plainly, you got to have bodies without minds. That's what a corpus is. But the argument goes you could also have minds without bodies. This is for instance what many people talk about gods or angels, which are the immaterial beings that can think, that can observe, that can act, but they don't have physical bodies in the same sense that we do. 
And anyway, that may be most important for people, the idea that often reason, the idea you are not your physical body, raises what must be for me and incredibly appealing consequence, which is that you can survive the destruction of the body. In fact, if you ask most people, religions and non-religions, what will happen after your body is destroyed, the answer is not well, I am dead then. That is, it's the end of things. But rather, the belief is that you can live on. Maybe you will end up in some spirit world, maybe you will ascend to heaven, if you're unlucky, maybe you will descend to hell. Maybe you will occupy some other body as in reincarnation, but the idea is that the destruction of your body need not be the destruction of you because you are not your body. All the, these beliefs, the beliefs about personal identity, the beliefs about life after death, about the existence of supernatural beings, about God. All the rest, at least to some extent on a dualist perspective, so materialism which says dualism is just plain one is an addiction view and should be tried as such. You shouldn't just short and write it down, you should grapple with it, you should worry about it, you should either be greatly accept or first against it. So why are modern day psychologists and neuroscience so confident that dualism is mistaken? Well, there are a few problems with it. One is that it simply doesn't help us explain certain things that need to be explained. Appealing to an immaterial world, to an immaterial soul, seems to talk certain questions that really do deserve an answer. So throughout this course we'll ask questions like how do we learn language? What do we find sexually attractive? How does memory work? There's a question about ourselves, about our minds. To say Oh, it all happens some immaterial realm. Leaves is hopeless when it comes to answering them. The second concern is that at the time the cards was correct. So infer from the illuminations of material things, physical things, that we probably are not physical things. We are talking about materialism, the idea that our mental life emerges from our physical brain. If you're listening closely, if you're thinking about this, I hope you'll acknowledge that this is an odd and unnatural view. I don't expect you to believe it, at least not at first. And in fact, for the most part, people are far more attracted to the doctrine called dualism. Dualism is an idea that's been found in just about every religion and every philosophy. It's made explicit in Plato, for instance. But I think the most rightful and articulate defender of dualism was the philosopher Emile Kant. Descartes believed that animals were material things. He thought that the doctrine of materialism was correct about non-human animals. But humans are different, Descartes recalled. For humans, there's a duality. We possess two sorts of things. We are composed of two sorts of things. We are in part material, but we are also in part spiritual, separate, mental, psychological. In some way, that doesn't reduce to the material he made to arguments for this, and they both reasonably good arguments at least quite persuasive at this time and have persuaded many people and continue to persuade many people. The first arguments for our non-material nature is that humans are capable of doing things that no machine, no material entity ever thought. So it might surprise you to hear this, but first in the 17th century was familiar with robots. He knew about the French Royal Gardens, which is like a 17th century Disneyland or Yellow Disney, which had robots that react when you approach them or when you step on certain stones. For instance, you might approach Diana and then Neptune will jump out from the bushes holding a trident. These robots are not of electricity but with water. So the girls knew about these robots and the girls asked. Well, maybe there are such things, maybe we are just machines responding to the environment. And he said that we can't be. He said maybe animals, non humans, animals can be, but human behavior is far more complicated and variegated and subtle to the explained in such simple ways. We will return to this point later on in the course when we talk about non Chmosky and non Chmosky's critique of behaviorism, which occurred that basically humans 
response in a relative reflexive way related to environment stimuli because along with Chomsky said that can be our behavior is far too complicated for that so we can't be machines his second argument is probably better now and it's based on intuition and his claim was we don't feel like bodies so to report it more technically we applied what was called a method of doubt he asked the question what do we know for sure and what we can question so for instance you might believe you were born in such and so place you could be wrong you could be discovered you might believe that the earth of thousands or millions of your souls but maybe the earth was great hundred years ago and all the memories that your grandparents have of the past we just manufactured you might believe said the gods that you're lying in a world of things but you're sitting on a chair or there's a veil in front of you or there's a computer near your hands but gods observe that we often believe such things when we are in dreams but weren't mistaken he observed that people who are mentally ill or we buried in some way might have such beliefs but don't be mistaken so you could be wrong that there's a physical world around you you could be wrong what the body that you have this is in ancient concern of course but it's best articulate in the movie the matrix which maidens that we think were running around in the physical world but actually with the lucky exception of our heroes like neo and Rindy, we are actually just plugged into some sort of system another version of this is that we are brains in a vet if you were a brain just a brain sitting in a vet with electrical rice simulating your experience you couldn't help maybe you are such things modern day philosophers for instance will argue that there's an excellent change what we are simulations we computer simulations so the guards and people following the guards said there's a lot we can't be sure of the things that we are seemingly must confess about in the real world can be shaken but the guards said there's one thing you can doubt you can doubt your own conditions you can doubt your own existence the famous line is i think therefore i am and spelling out this intuition builds in from the fact you could doubt that you have a body, but you can doubt that you have mind. The Gans wrote, I knew that I was a substance, the whole essence or nature of which is to think, and that for its existence there is no need of any place, nor does it dependent in a natural things. That is to say, the soul by which I am that I am is entirely distinct from body so that's a psychological case for dualism but as i said dualism is also emerged out of common sense think about how you describe your body you describe your bodies if you possess it my arm my health my body my brain as it's it's something separate from you that you have or consider your intuition about personal identity so typically as people age the can do this Consciousness follows the body, so I get 10 years older, my mind 10 years older, my brain is 10 years older. It's all connected together, but we easily accept at least an affection that people can hope from one body to another. There are many comedies that involve body switching, body sleeps. There are movies that involve somebody going to sleep one morning as one person and walking up as another. We understand they fiction they aren't real but they make sense to us there's an intuitive rational to this we don't walk out of the early and say i am totally confused that happened there rather at least with our naive conception of the self we accept that lifts of the possibility that you can hope from the body to another none of this is limited to modern day movies the most famous short story of history by Franz Kafka begins with a sentence as Gregor Samsa awoke one morning from uneasy dreams. He found himself transformed in his bed into a gigantic insect.